Welcome to Putty. Uh, my name is Erin K. Drew. Uh, this is a live art talk show. Some, why is the show called Putty? Why Putty? Um, as you know, as I like to remind you, uh, there are a few objects, there are a few items that I take a lot of spiritual influence in on the show, namely and specifically Museum Putty. You, uh, those of you who are in the exhibitions department, who have been behind the scenes uh, in any art context know that this is a material that's used to stick items to pedestals to kind of elevate precious objects. Um, it's a little bit undersung. It enjoys a low role in a high institution. Um, we like it. We like museum putty. We also like silly putty. Um, the best and only novelty object. Um, we like to use it to lay across the funny papers, uh, a appropriate and distort the face of Blondie and Dagwood, um, and apply this sort of lesson to the art talk show format. So um, that's what we'll be doing tonight. We'll be trying. We will try. Um, I always try. But, so, okay, let me tell you. Tonight's the season finale of Putty. Um, will it be a cliffhanger? <laughs> It would be the most boring cliffhanger. It will be like, will I get a hangover? <laughs> what kind of hangover will it be? Will I be urgently horny? <laughs> will I be uh, tearfully grateful for everyone I know in my life that's ever showed me a kindness? Um, find out next season. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine asked me if um, maybe one of the main characters will die in at the end of the first for the cliffhanger putty. I don't know. The night is young, guys. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, I'm about to go on tour. Putty's going on tour. This is exciting information. This is the only information I've been telling anyone for the last uh, 13 years. Um, going on tour is definitely the most audacious thing I've ever done. Um, just insofar as I think it's outrageous to be like, I'm going on tour. I put up my sign, I talk to people, and I say, this is a show and you should look at it. Um, and so I've been sort of grappling with um, the existential aspects of that, and so like I've been looking to my friends who are in bands for some like insight where it's like, what do you do? You just think that that's okay? Like you just do that? And they're just like, I never thought about it. I don't know. That's encouraging. <laughs> um, I don't know how you evaluate performances on tour. That's my hot topic right now. I'm asking people what uh, to do. Like, you know, obviously I can't rely on how many people come. Um, you know, one person proposed that maybe the amount of conversations I have after the show would be um, one way to evaluate if it's a good performance. Another person said, if I hand out a tomato to everyone in the audience and see how many people throw the tomato, that could be a way to tell as well. I like the quantitative, the quantitative information. Um, please come see me on tour. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the end of Putty because I want to do some other stuff. Um, specifically, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> I have an enormous vat of indigo dye at my house. Do you want to come over? Uh, it's tomorrow. I think I'm going to dye the futon cover at our house. Um, is it social practice? Are you making dinner? If so, then it is. Um, you can, really, seriously, if you want to come over to my house and dye something in an enormous vat of indigo dye, please come. Um, that's, that's just actually happening. That's information. Um, I'm also in the process of designing a placemat for State Street Pub. No one asked me to do it, but I think that they need one. So it's going to be kind of
have like the, the kind you encounter at your 24-hour diner. Uh, there might be a map of the United States you can color in um, based on where you ate a burger. Or um, I'm thinking there could also be a word jumble. Um, and so I'm currently collecting suggestions for the word jumble. So far we've got Mama Kitty and Caldwell Tester. Um, it's way... I'm interested in your suggestions for the State Street Pub word jumble because I know that it'll already be way funner than the, like if there was to be a putty placemat, which like the words would be like precarity and abjection. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'm just ready to like shift focus. I'm ready to think about other things. I'm ready to unload some mood rings. There are four. They are left over. They are in the back of house. They're there with Steve. Um, you can buy one. They're six bucks. They're the only thing that I can do to fund my tour. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, that's that's. That's, in the, that's the end. That's the end of my monologue, I think. Um, <laughs> please buy a mood ring. Please sign up for the Putty newsletter if you're interested in what will happen in season three of Putty. You know, where we'll end up. You know, God, it could be months before we see one another. There's a clipboard on the bar. There's a clipboard near the front. Um, that would be a perfect place for you to, like, feed me some of those answers about what is in the word jumble, um, or <laughs> how I should evaluate performance from here on out. <laughs> anyway, my first guest of the evening, I'd like to, I'd like to welcome to the stage. She's a, a filmmaker, she's a photographer, she's an educator, um, and she's a resident of Muncie, Indiana. If you could please join me in welcoming Mara Jasper to the stage. Hello. Hi, try it. It's a little scary. I know. How do I get it out? It's kind of like a, you can Fiona Apple it if you want, but <laughs> no, this is better. I, I know. I'm like, hi. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Mario. Thank you for being on Putty. Thanks for having me, Erin. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm interested in discussing, early on when we first spoke, you said you were doing, you in the past have done a project, not unlike Putty, a talk show, um, sort of taking cues from late night TV. Uh, we took cues from late night TV, flux concerts. Uh, so. Actually, some people who did that, Jacinda, who's sitting out here, Mark, uh, did the Hello Show in Muncie, which was, uh, and we did a version of it in Ger uh, in Austria, but it was, it's a long time ago, it was 2010. So we started doing Hello, which was, if if you're familiar with, I mean, th I think everyone knows Alan Capro, right? So, like, he did the telehappening called Hello, and it was done at MIT, I want to say 1968, and it was just like these... Uh, it was basically how we use Skype today, but with like TV sets, and it's like him and Nam June, and they're all like, hey, hello, 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 and it's like, <laughs> and they're kind of blown away that they've got this like live interaction, but uh, so I kind of stole that, and then uh, we did, I guess, I'm trying to remember what the, how we were streaming it back then, but it was Ustream. It was like a, something that basically no longer exists except for commercial purposes, but um, yeah, people would come to the house, we would get a, um, you'd be given like a Fluxus directive, you'd get a card that told you what to do. Um, I believe you guys would sit around, I'm looking at Jacinda, you guys would sit around and I'd make dinner. And you would get your cards and you'd have to figure out what you were going to do. And then we had a set upstairs in my house and everybody would go upstairs and at 8 o'clock it was showtime and we had a score and you would just run through the show. Anyone could do it, and anyone could run the camera, anyone could run the sound. Um, I was watching a lot of Glenn O'Brien's TV party at the time, so I was way into blurring of audience and performer. 
and that came right down to the technology. So it was like if you were there and you wanted to run the camera, you could run the camera. Um, were there audience in house at the time, or was it more for an audience that was invisible? When we did it in Muncie, it was whoever was part of it was there. Um, not everyone was on stage at any one time, so there were people in the room and pets were walking in and out. And I mean, it was kind of chaos. But uh, when we did it in Austria, we had a huge audience, and that felt crazy. And also, there was a huge uh, language issue, <laughs> which, you know, we were doing things like, um, you know, I like watching old TV, so I like, er like Ernie Kovacs and things like that, so, you know, we'd be pulling out, like, we kind of pushed it way past Fluxus, and we'd be pulling out Ernie Kovacs sketches, and... So what in particular, then? There's one where you have to go to the dentist, and you have to have a tooth extracted while you're lying on a table <laughs> and try to translate that. I don't know. I mean, we would just show people the sketch and say, okay, here's your sketch. Now it's your turn. You go do it. You're on. And it, we learned a lot about humor and how humor <laughs> translates in different countries. Um, and then we did something like this at Elsewhere Residency in North Carolina. We did something called Bacchus Banter, and cool. we streamed that also on, um, I think it was also Ustream. Um, Elsewhere Residency for Context for People is it's in, uh, is it Raleigh, North Carolina? Uh, Greensboro. Greensboro. And it's an old thrift store that has been transformed into a residency. It's multiple stories. Um, all of the objects from the residency, or from the, the store are still on site and kind of material that people can Not, use. It's a living museum. Nothing's allowed to leave. So um, it, the guy who runs it, uh, his grandmother, he inherited the whole thrift store from his grandmother who ran a business there. It was, originally was an Army Navy surplus. Her husband passed away and over time she, you know, she had to raise her family and suddenly she's like, I'm running this Army Navy surplus. And, um, and then it turned into a thrift store in the like 70s and she became a hoarder through a number of you know, traumatic life events. And, um, and then George inherits this, and he turns it into an artist residency where nothing is allowed to leave. So you make your work there on location. You do not take anything with you out of that place. So every speck of dirt, it doesn't matter what it is. Like I was cleaning out archives, and we had buckets of dirt, and I was told you can't, they can't leave. But they're, they're like, they would love putty. Like you would love elsewhere. So. Um, the live show that you did at Elsewhere, how did that vary from what you were, Hello, or the program that you were kind of running out of your house? It was, I mean, it was chaos, and I love chaos, so it was like, but there were way more people, there were people coming and going, it was open to the public, and... Uh, would they sit in and then be guests? We, no, we, 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 so we set up a thing with couches and landscapes behind us and everybody had a good coffee mug and, you know, I mean, everything you expect to see. And then um, people would come in and we would ask them if they wanted to be on the talk show. And so anyone from the public could come in and sit down and or just interview them. And it really was just, I mean... I sat there for hours. Kids, little kids were really funny. <laughs> <laughs> what were your favorite questions to ask? I talked to one little kid about being a gymnast <laughs> for a long time. And I mean, I don't think I ever asked the same questions. Mm -hmm. I think we just, it was like you just feel out every person, you know, what brings you here? And, you know, I, it, I think I really liked talking to the kids. They were funny. Um, what did the set like? look like for that particular show and how did that sort of vary from I mean it seems like with Hello it was sort of specifically aestheticized and influenced by like the talk shows you were looking at at the time mm, both were but the, the difference was that we had more space at Elsewhere so when we did Hello we were doing that you know the two spaces we did that in were cramped uh, performance space and the other one was the upstairs of my house, which was obviously really cramped, and we had a 12-foot backdrop that we would switch out. And so you're doing things really fast, and they're cramped, right? Like, it's weird. And it's great because it's cramped, because it's kind of crazy. But uh, elsewhere was, we actually, you know, you're working with a bunch of artists, so when you say, like, let's make it look like a talk show, mm -hmm. 
how is it different from being seven years old and saying, let's make a talk show? And, like, and that's what we did. It stands for our parents. Yeah, and we, like, and we had thrift store paintings. and Because it was a thrift store, everything we needed was right there. That makes total sense. It was um, beautiful. <laughs> right, that's sort of reflexive or something. Um, I guess something I really enjoyed when uh, I talked to you about my talk show project was that you immediately like offered a like a like a resource of like you know multiple talk show precedents that I should look at and consider you know borrowing influence from stealing so I get yeah I get the impression that you are you know well versed in TV of a certain era and I'm interested in how where that showed up in your work uh, over time it's I think it's still showing up in the work. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it's that overt. I feel like the talk shows were more overt, like doing Bacchus banter and things like that were more, it was a more overt way to do that. Um, I think I was scribbling on the notes that I handed back to you, because I like, so I don't know, like I watched a lot of TV when I was a kid. Like I love TV, I love old TV. Um, I probably look at more TV than I look at art, but um, like I would, You've probably all seen. Do you know, like, if I say Mark, Mark Goodson, Bill Todman, does that ring a bell for anybody? It's like, have you seen like Family Feud, Tattletales? Has anyone seen Double Dare? Yeah. yeah, Double Dare. Double Dare is like. So like, I looked at this and I'm like, oh, that's like Double Dare, but like Double Dare is like a million of that, and like <laughs> you and I would be in separate booths, and I wouldn't be able to see you, and you wouldn't be able to see me, and I'd be like, answer the question, Aaron, and like. Double Dare was awesome. So like I look at things like that and I I kind of die a little inside because I know that nothing I make will ever be as good as Double Dare. And, like, and the same thing, yeah, it, it's like you're kind of stealing things. Right. You're stealing. I think where I steal the most actually is with using old technology because I like the old technology and the way that it looks. So what in particular have you been applying that to recently? The Middletown project, when okay. we shot that, we shot that all with old broadcast, vintage broadcast cameras that like, so I'd been buying these old uh, uh, Sony and Panasonic old box, the, like 1972, 73 era broadcast cameras and you have to, the video signal comes out of the bottom of the camera and there's a red light on the top and they're really incredibly beautiful machines and they shoot in black and white and the color ones if you get a color one it's just gorgeous and they're low resolution everybody looks beautiful like they're <laughs> they look great and like I imagine this being John Berger's oh like, my god you know, BBC they're, camera that is also yeah like and so like, like to shoot that. with those things first of all like I think in when we were working with them in the time we were shooting um, actually Sarah you're here you were there for those shoots and like the um, we pretty much all our cameras broke over the the four days. Like we had enough cameras to get through the shoot, but we were pulling everything we could from them. And beautiful black and white broadcast, beautiful cameras. So the Middletown project is a body work or a specific project that you've been working on for years now. And you're you've been living in Muncie and it seems like that has really, you know, informed and Muncie. like been an essential part of this project. So could you just sort of back up and give us an overview of what this Middletown project is that you're doing? Uh, so um, the city of Muncie was the subject of a social, a, a major social study in 1929 that ex has continued on today. Um, and in 1980 there was a filmmaker who visited the city Peter Davis, who made a film called Hearts and Minds. He got an Academy Award for it, and he's a well-known documentary filmmaker and journalist. They made a series of six documentaries about the city of Muncie, and they were an extension of that social, um, that the study of the city. And those six documentaries aired on PBS nationally, um, and they were, he hired six filmmakers to make them, and they were really incredible cinema verite documentary uh, filmmakers like Ricky Leacock. I mean, there were fantastic people on this on these. Um, 
And it ended up being fairly controversial within the city for the way they were represented, which was fair. Um, I looked at that, I looked at the films about 10 years ago when they came out on DVD and was new to the city, right? And like, I, I moved here from the, the East Coast, so um, I just was trying to understand where I lived. And I looked at that, those films, and they were incredibly beautiful. And it was also like right at, uh, you know, 2008, the economy is really bad. And I'm walking around in Muncie, and I'm trying to understand what it all is. And uh, why does it look this way? And why, why are there no jobs? Like, what, what is this? And, um, and I just started learning everything I could about the city, about the people, about the economy. Just tried to do, like, you know, in an artist way. Um, so you weren't familiar with the Middletown projects before you no, moved to Muncie? No, I knew nothing. And I decided I want to make something about this to help me understand where I live and what this is. Um, and the more I dug, <laughs> the deeper I dug, and the more endless it became, and then I discovered that uh, Ball State University owned all of the outtake footage to those documentaries. And I got to be the first person to open up the cans of film, like shot by Ricky Leacock. And the school had purchased the material. Uh, Peter Davis had set up a deal with them that when it was done, he would, he would make sure Ball State could take it. It was so controversial that Peter Davis goes on TV on, on um, the public radio station there and he makes a public announcement. He says, well, hey, if you don't like the way you've been represented here, he takes all these phone calls from the public and they're screaming at him. And, um, and he says, if you don't like the way you've been represented, I'm going to leave all the footage. I find this afterwards. Wait, so why was the material controversial? Like what, um, how would you describe it? Just for people who had never seen it before. Uh, not all of the films were controversial, but the ones where people did not like the way they, they felt they had been, there's a lot of class issues at stake, right? So you bring in all these filmmakers from New York City, and they start filming people who are um, living in the Midwest with different sets of values and a different, uh, different economic situations, and yeah, it sets up a weird dynamic immediately. And um, you know, and there's all the ethics of of representation that you know we we all know about, but. Um, People felt they had been portrayed as, as like Hicks, and uh, they there were a, particularly the film Seventeen, which was um, showed high school kids their last year of school, and it portrayed an interracial relationship. There are kids on camera smoking pot. Um, there's an underage keg scene where you know these kids are drinking, and um, and you know, and you can see at times where like me and. Um, the mother in the film turns directly to the camera person and asks if he wants to contribute to the keg, and you see like money come out from the front of the camera. Um, and then there's all kinds of things about you know when the film actually, which Seventeen, you know, I, I must say it's a beautiful, beautiful film, and I actually think it might be the strongest film of the six films. Um, it ended in in lawsuits between Peter Davis and the filmmakers, between the the the. The, you know, the young adults and their families who were portrayed and, um, but it was the people at the public radio station in Muncie who were running it who did not like what they saw and then they immediately brought the families in with the kids, they sh shouldn't call them kids, but they, they showed them the footage, they showed them the final film and then they kept saying, well you didn't really mean to do that and that you didn't really, you didn't really do those things, you must have been coerced and um, and then it became unclear whether people had signed um, release forms. And then it became just this crazy legal issue where people from Muncie were getting on a plane and going to Washington, D.C. to go right to public broadcasting. And eventually it was not aired publicly. And it has not been allowed to be aired publicly in Muncie to be, to be screened. So there's this sticky situation where the film is unflattering, the material that the filmmaker is framed is, you know, you know, might make them look, might make the subjects look like Hicks or whatever. But um, Leacock says that the the footage is left behind. Well, yeah. So 
Um, Ricky Lee Cock only shot one of them. The, the um, 17 was um, shot by Jeff Crines and Joel DeMott. And they, yeah, but the, the, so all of the footage that's left behind to Ball State, everything but 17. Okay. Because there was a crazy lawsuit afterwards. And so 17, those filmmakers took their material with them and they split from Peter Davis, who would, like, was in charge of all of the films. So the material that you now have your hands on, what is that? So that's what I'm working with. And so I went through all the footage and we have great footage. It's incredible, like, you know, beautiful stuff. You learn so much about people and about the city and the history. And um, But so, I, you know, I've lived there a long time. And I, so people, when they found out I was working on it, would say, hey, well, I was filmed. You know, you should find this footage of me and my kids and like, you know, um, I had so many people telling me they were filmed and then there's this one family and they said, yeah, we were actually filmed a bunch of, bunch of times by this Japanese film crew came in and, um, you know, if you ever find it, let us know. And so one day I'm going through, there's, you know, 900 reels of film and you're going through all of it and I'm looking at this spreadsheet and I see something that says Fuji. I'm like, what's Fuji? And I ask the director of the archives, and he says, well, I think it's just a film test. And I said, well, let's open them and see. And I open it up, and there's this family, and I know these people. And they're being followed by a Japanese film crew, and the film crew is being followed by the Middletown film crew, because the Middletown film crew is like, well, we gotta find out what's going on with these Japanese people. And so, like, it's crazy. It's like, here's this family, and they're just this, like, they're going grocery shopping, they go to the bank, they go to, like, the Boy Scouts, and. And there's a, like, it looks like paparazzi. And all these Japanese people are following them to see what's typical, what's typical American, which is at the crux of the studies. Because everything about these studies and about the films is supposed to portray ordinary Americans in their typical day in Muncie, Indiana. But they're followed by tons of film crews. <laughs> and it seemed like there were like some notes to kind of coach them in their behavior where it was like, look, make it look more rural or... So, yeah, there's transcripts, right? So I have all these Japanese, so I've got... I, not only did I get the, the footage, but I have all the translation. And so they'll be talking. There, there's a great scene where they're talking. They go up to this kid's bedroom and they're like, well, you're about to see a typical 15-year-old boy's bedroom. And the whole crew goes up the stairs, and they enter the room, and there's a picture of Daisy Duke. Like, a, one of those, you know, the things you would buy at, like, you know, I don't know, one of those stores that sell kitschy crap for kids, and like, um, and he's got this poster in there, and there's another one of Farrah Fawcett. And, you know, it's 1982. And this kid is so proud of these posters, and he takes Mr. Yamakawa in, and he says, these, and this is my bedroom, and, and these are my posters, and these are American movie stars. And Mr. Yamakawa is like turning to his interpreter and talking in front of the kid, and he's not talking. Well, I mean, he's trying to understand. <laughs> like he, he's just like, these, these are awful. This is just terrible. Like, what is this? And he's like, I would never let my kid hang this up. And then, you know, so I have the transcripts. You can see what he's saying. And the poor 15-year-old kid, he has no idea what Mr. Yamakawa is saying. He's just, like, looking at him, waiting for a response. Mr. Yamakawa turns to him and says, where did you get these posters? Who gave you the money? And the kid is like, my mom. <laughs> He's, it's just, it's full of things like that. Or them saying, can you re-enter the back door? How, how do you exit to go to the supermarket? Oh, can you put the sugar back on the shelf at the Marsh store? And... It grab the ketchup again, and they keep doing this over and over again. So the video that you're making is an edit that shows the Japanese film crew following around uh, the American family that are also being followed around by the Middletown filmmakers. <laughs> that's the first part of it, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's part one, part one. And the second part kind of gets into that set construction that we were talking about, that kind of references like old TV. Part two is really weird, yeah. So part two, I rebuilt the family's house from 1982 inside a theater. And like we did a whole set, which like thank you to one of the Indiana individual artist grants, like and a couple of other grants. We had money to do that and hire a female film crew, which I was so happy about. And um, so yeah, I got this like this great woman, Kate Giordano, to come in from New York who could run all the vintage cameras and we got like 
we went in, we built this in like, you know, it's a set. It's not their house. Like, you couldn't really live in this, right? Yeah, you like, said it had some you know, sort of like sitcom tropes oh, where there's like so a. So, I love Norman Lear. And so, I. I all in the we family. Built, yeah, Norman Lear, producer, all in the family. And I'm obsessed with that inside of All in the Family and the set. Um, which has been reused in other, in other shows, and you can see it, like they, they kind of reverse it, and cause they don't throw things away, you think they do, but like, anyhow, the, um, yeah, so we kind of reconfigured the inside of their house, like all the scenes that you can see in, from the 1982 footage, uh, and then we set it up so it was more like all in the family, but it's their house. Uh, we were lucky, because their house actually had the staircase, and it had like, you know, all in the family, there's no fireplace, but we were, I don't know, you, you know, you can infer, it's art, like it, you know, there were the chairs that you needed, and um, yeah, we just had to move walls around when we had to switch scenes sometimes. But so it's sort of a recreation, recreation of their house. shot as a three camera shoot with vintage cameras, edited as a 22 minute sitcom. <laughs> Where the family is watching the footage of themselves from the past being followed around by that's, two crews of filming. That's the segue. So I never showed the family the footage until the day I brought them to a hotel room to recreate exactly the way the Japanese people were watching them in a hotel room. And so I rented a hotel room, brought them in, and they're watching themselves for the first time. Uh, in like 30 years and they're you know it's emotional right like I knew not to show them the footage I showed them enough footage showed them enough footage to get them in the game and I saved footage for the hotel room because I knew that that was only one moment that you had to shoot that and that was it and so we um, and I, I feel really lucky because we had really good, I had such good people working on it that we were able to get beautiful footage and um, and it's taking me a very long time to do. And I, I feel bad because it's taking me so long. But I'm not someone who, like shooting it, we had a small crew, you know, it's very DIY. But, um, but when I edit, I do that by myself. And so it's not, um, you know, and I teach, so we're, it's just, it is crazy. You're just trying to get it done. And so you, you generously showed me uh, one cut of it when I visited you at your studio, and that was... And I didn't show you the old vintage camera stuff either. Yeah. I showed you the Japanese people. Um, so I'm, this is a long time coming. It's a project that you've been working on for years at this point. I, I want to say 10 years since I started researching it, and it's probably been seven years since I actually started working directly on it. Um, but while you do this, like you said, you're also I teaching. I make other projects, your because I have to get tenure, so I make other projects too. So I, <laughs> I call it side salad. Like I make these little things that you can put into the world that can like put a line on your resume so that you can get things out to people quickly and then I meanwhile I go back and I work on the big project. It's like writing a book but you have to put like things out to you know it's just like it's what you have to do. And I know that one of those projects is helping to organize a film festival and that like film festivals have been an interesting way that you or a, been a way that you've shown work uh, in the past also. So I made other small things. <laughs> I made other little, you know, small things. I, to me, a lot of them, they're, they're studies, right? So you put them out, send them to experimental film festivals. Um, we have an awesome new film festival in Muncie that everyone should send your work to, which is called That One Film Festival, and it's run through the Muncie Arts and Culture Council. Uh, I helped get that started and I was working this year with Kristen Reeves who's an awesome experimental filmmaker and uh, we had a yeah I mean it was great we brought in um, we brought in visual artist Liz Rada to come in and like look at the work to um, decide who gets the prizes for it and we brought in John Derringer from Electronic Arts Intermix in New York to also do that and so John and Liz got to present work and yeah, it was an awesome. We got great work in Muncie. In fact, I feel funny because I it, it was it would have been worth all of you driving in for, 
Yeah. There were great films we showed. No, I absolutely get the, the impression that there is a lot of stuff happening in Muncie and that um, you're generating a lot of energy, you know, through this project that you're doing deep research on, but also yeah, we, some spooks. There's a whole bunch of us trying to make things happen in Muncie and working very, very hard. And there's a, like some of us are here tonight, but um, I think Brady Eulis has been very instrumental in that. And, um, there's a new Ply Space residency that's gotten started, which is really great. You should all look at like look it up and apply for it. It's new. Uh, you get a studio space. You live in Muncie, and if you apply for the School of Art fellowship through Ply Space residency, you partner with Ball State University School of Art. You do 12 weeks, and you get a stipend. It's pretty awesome, actually. Muncie is pretty much the Paris of Indiana mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> 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 I gotta say, like, I, I'm not from the Midwest, but I, Muncie really made me learn to love things here. And I, I don't think I, I think it was good to go to a place where everything was really different and you had to ask questions. And I think asking questions is really a big part of being an artist. And if you get too comfortable and you think you've got it all figured out, then I'm not sure how that reflects back in your work. Like, it was good to be challenged and it was, it's still good to walk around and figure out what what is it trying to understand things, you know. I don't understand that much. <laughs> the very last question I want to ask um, is about your karaoke documentary project because I know there's going to be some green screen of karaoke, karaoke here tonight. And we love karaoke. Yeah. I, I feel like I've just oddly like profiled a lot of karaoke artists like through this show. I don't know, it seems like the Karaoke in art is having like a moment, but um, karaoke's had a moment for a long time. Oh, really? Okay. Everyone Good. loves karaoke, right? Like, yeah. Or they, or they tell what it's like. Or you like watching it. Yeah. Um, so you did a long-running karaoke project where you documented singers, specifically singing their favorite songs, but you invited them to your house. No, I no, actually I was living in New York City, and so I lived in New York for ten years, and I had a studio there, and. Actually, back then, I never thought that I would be working with video. And I, I, I worked for the artist Nam June Pike, and I would do really weird things for Nam June. Like, you know, at first I would sweep the floor, and then I moved up to helping him buy TVs for the robots. And then one day he gave me a broken <laughs> camera. And he's like, you take this camera and you make something. And I was like, oh yeah, sure, free camera. And like, I, you know, I set it up in my studio and you know, I'd taken video classes before at MassArt, but you know, I didn't have I didn't have resources. Um, and once I had that stupid broken camera, I and I had a studio, and I bought a twelve foot backdrop. I bought tons of backdrops. Actually, I would have like you know four or five different backdrops, silver mylar. I would loved karaoke. I love vocalists. Like I love music. Like I love vocalists. And back then, I was way into watching things like Frank Sinatra's Timex Hour, and like you know, I love all these old TV shows where people would come on and they'd sing and special guest stars and. Um, and yeah, and I just went to karaoke bars all over Manhattan. I would bring a Polaroid camera, and I would just take pictures of people, and I would walk up to them after with a silver pen, and I would say, can you autograph this? And on the back, can you tell me your name, your age, and what you do for a living? And so they'd write all the info on the back side, and they'd sign it in silver on the front. When you do that enough times, you get to know everybody. And I would go out four nights a week to all these different karaoke <laughs> bars, and I knew everybody. And then I realized, like, these people come, they sing, they come sing one signature song. So if I'm out on Tuesday night at one bar, Wednesday night I might see the same person sing the same song at a different bar. They just, you know, go around, they sing the same songs. And you get to know them, so I would invite them back to my studio. And then that would change. I would say, please come back to my studio, I'm doing a project. Um, I was really interested in people who were doing like photography work where it was like, you know, doing these kind of, uh, you know, many people, you know, social studies of people. Um, I, yeah, I just invite them back and then I would talk to them on the phone for a very long time and I'd say, this is your thing. What do you want this to look like? And then we would work very hard to make it look that way. And we would, I said, you, I want you to come sing your signature song. What is your signature song? 
And so it became what their signature song was. I saw this as I saw them as portraits, and they decided what kind of backdrop they would have. If I had to buy new stuff, I would buy new stuff. Uh, we would shoot them in like a gang kind of thing. So meaning I might book five people in one night, which was about as many as I could do. Um, I had four or five people working with me, and we would set it up like this. We put chairs out. We'd have a much bigger space, so you could. Um, in between uh, singers. I had like a little green room and you'd have drinks for people and stuff and in between singers it was very quick, you'd very quickly change the backdrop, switch out the songs and we did it like a live show. But each person got four takes and that was it. So you might sing the same song four times and then you'd get all the Polaroids that you wanted and when they left they'd sign this big, big book and I did it pretty much the whole time I lived in New York City. So again, we shot like little kids, old people, my neighbors, the deli guys. Like, I mean, honestly, everybody had made it into that studio. And then we, like, you know, people in bands would come by and be like, okay, Kid Congo, how about like, yeah, you do your song. And like, it was super fun. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if you've sat down that project, but I, I hope that you'll look at uh, Green Screen Karaoke with a documentarian's eye this evening. <laughs> if not, purchase through a it drunk yourself. Eye. Yeah, yes. I'm very excited about Green Screen Karaoke. Because I love Green Screen. I, love I feel karaoke. excited, like, it's a good wrap up for, you know, this series of artists. But it's like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> it's very good. Um, all right, Jasper, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Erin. All it's right. Been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. My next guest uh, is a photographer. He is currently <coughs> studying at School of the Art Institute of Chicago. We've been friends for 10 years, and I can't wait to talk to William Kine. Please come to the stage. I was wondering if maybe you could start by offering some context as to how we met. We met at Heron in undergrad uh, in a comics class. And I was trying to think what our respective comics were about. Yeah. Do you remember? I loosely do. I think that you made one comic that was based on The Never Ending Story. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. it was Gumby, but yeah. Oh, know. that would make total sense, but <laughs> yeah, this is my memory. Right. This is my memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember anything of my content? No, I remember how they look, and but I don't remember the content. It's just so like the fucking story. <laughs> and are you still making comics at all? I'm not. Yeah, neither am I. No. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great, you know, sort of segue into talking about um, the way our our particular practices have developed, and in particular yours, which um, has taken you at this point to the photo program at School of the Art Institute, the, the MFA program um, in Chicago. I wanted to start by saying, how much do you hate grad school? Did I, did I tell you someone that asked me I that? Did. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still gonna say, I, um, that's a good question. That's a good question, that's my <laughs> answer. That's, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but I'll have to do it for now. So. Okay. Um. Um. <laughs> You told me that before you started, uh, I guess sort of the last time I saw you before, uh, kind of as you were on your like journey to interview at School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, you were going through what you expected some of the questions might be. And you said that you anticipated answering this question, which was like one of the hardest things I could think of to answer, which was what would you bring to that particular program? So to the photo program, um, and I'm interested to know like how you ended up answering that question. Well, you know, they didn't end up asking that question, but I, you know, kind of that was a suggestion on what might be asked, you know, and I was like, well, fuck it, I'll try to, I'll try to figure that out, you know. Um, so months of deep reflection and, and writing and. Uh, 
a lot of reading, you know, a real dedicated practice to kind of get to these answers in a truthful way, in a meaningful way. Um, and, and then so many of those questions I was asking myself, which I'm glad I did, you know, weren't, really, weren't really addressed to me. And um, that whole interview process was really a, quite a blur at this point. But I do remember there was a series of sort of like after interview events where this was a sort of network and schmooze and you know, I'm already coming in here kind of feeling like an outsider, self-imposed for, for sure, you know, self-identifying as such. And I just, I didn't really, you know, I was very exhausted. I was like, traveling to get there, just you know, barely making it there. And um, it, was, it was a suggestion that I should, I should keep going to every subsequent like after party event, moving from a ballroom to a bar to another bar to like God knows where next. And so someone, someone in the program was like, well, you didn't get to speak with the chair. And I really think you should, and um, and I just you know maybe in this really midwestern way, I just walked up to her after he provoked me to, and I said, well, hey, you know, I never got to answer this question. What would I bring to this program? And I said, um, you know, maybe some emotional intelligence, and and she just said, yeah, I, th I think we could really use that. We could use that everywhere. And that's it. It's not much of a punchline, but um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like. For me, hearing about the school prior to going there, that you know, there's um, an intellectual kind of stance of conceptual work first, not even the materialization of art, and that ideas rule. Um, and certainly, to me, that kind of elicited an image of a, a really dry, chin scratching intellectual who's dispassionate and has no emotion. So, and. You know, that's not necessarily true, but um, I knew that at least I was operating from a place of emotion, um, intuition, um, not, you know, not everything had resolved itself in an intellectual way, so I did feel pretty strong about where is my heart, where is my gut, as messy as that may be, um, that's what I'm going to lead with, and that's what I would like to bring, bring to a program, so that's it, yeah. So you've been making photographs for, how, how long have you seen? like been focusing on making photographs specifically? Um, you know, I mean, I've always, it's such a tr tr tricky question. Um, <clears throat> best, best way to maybe, maybe frame this is to say, I've never taken, um, you know, a higher level or you know, even a high school photo class in my life. So, so this MFA experience is the first formal um, photo education I've ever received, aside from, uh, aside from a, a, a pinhole camera class took in a summer, my mother dumped me off at the University of Muncie, like she did, but she would drop me out at like Bible school in the summer too, because it was sort of a free, um, free childcare. And so I ended up making a pinhole camera and then uh, shooting a potted plant that I brought in from home. And that's, that's it. That was like my first and only photo class. And, um, but then when I, you know, as I was uh, getting older, I would make, I mean, I'm talking about like, 10 years old. So when I'm 10 years old, I'm uh, making like little videos of my brother in the basement. My parents did buy a, uh, a video camera, like 89 or something like that. My brother was really into, um, really into hair metal. So uh, I think we did like a Motley Crue spoof music video, and then we did like a, oh God, what, Slaughter? Yeah, we did a Slaughter music video. So that was like the first time, every, I mean, when you kind of hear about like um, these like really famous American directors talking about like what did they make when they were kidding. It's always it's always the same. We made war films, you know. We we made GI Joe styled films, you know. I didn't do that, but I did like you know late eighties hair metal music videos. Um, and I do remember uh, the video of your brother like slowed down playing. You right, know, right. Some sort of you know, hair metal like showing up at an installation that you made. In yeah, undergrad. yeah, yeah. So that well, that kind of gives you an example of what I did in undergrad, um, which I was a sculpture major at Heron, and I mean, I did a lot of various things that I can do: performance work and video installation, and a lot of fabric work. But you know, I think it was when I I had actually like left school, left undergrad um, after maybe two years, and just was feeling um, disimpassionate and just. Uh, really burnt out and didn't feel like the right fit for me being in art school. Um, so I, I, I blazed out of there and took off to the West Coast for a year. And I also had a pretty healthy speed addiction. So I had a Polaroid camera and I'd go steal film from this local kind of like kind of Walmart adjacent kind of place. And this was like the last era of that, you know, the original Polaroid manufacturing. So it was just like boosting this film, getting rid 
hooked on speed and going to the mountains with friends and I would take them like on these long hikes, like hour long hikes, two hour long hikes to the, the top of a, a mountain and I, was, and I was bringing all these props and the costumes and like, dressing them up and taking these portraits of them with this polar, Polaroid film and it got like, it got weirder and weirder and it just became like where it was just me and another guy basically doing speed and then like taking photos in the dark and like the Oregon wilderness. <laughs> But, but I like learned a lot about composition and I learned about how to, how to direct and how to uh, work with other people and it, it, and it seemed really magical. Um, it, was, it was great from the, from the sort of production to like just the same sensation I think everyone feels or felt, you know, with Polaroids, just watching it develop. That was exciting. Um, so that was like, that was like, honestly, my first like concentrated effort to make work, but maybe not with a capital W, but, you know, really trying to formalize some sort of expression. I don't know what it was. I still haven't interpreted it. It hasn't resolved itself through history. But, um, you know, then when I, 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 I still only stayed out on the West Coast for a year and then came back to Indiana and tried to finish up my uh, degree. And that's, I kind of really launched myself with a more considered effort into, into video work. Um, still, like, really unsure, of, sure of like, you know, buttoning down the subject matter, what do I want to do? But I was, I was using the equipment, and I was shooting things, and I was taking risks. Um, but you know, in any way that photography, uh, I relate to photography now. You know, that that real um, push or that effort didn't really come about until you know, maybe four or five years ago. So. Yeah. So Pluto has been there. Throughout, yes. um, but it seems like you've taken a more energetic turn into focusing on making photographs in particular. And I feel like I want to ask you a question: like, what do your photographs look like at this point? What do they look like? In, yeah. in what sense? What? Who are you taking <coughs> photographs of, and what are your? What do they end up looking like? Um, well, I mean, if you talk to probably anyone who's been through an MFA program um, specific to like photography, if they're working within maybe the documentary tradition or social documentary, you know, um, subjective documentary, and they're going to like, to some extent, be dependent upon what's around them and what's available because you're strapped for cash, you're in grad school, there's a lot of pressure to show up and be sober-minded and um, make it through you know, the waking hours of school and then make work on top of that, right? But, um, so I've been, I've been really excited to be back in the Midwest um, because there is a vernacular that I understand um, here. And so I feel in some ways it's like bringing it all back home. That being said, um, you know, I just wanted to find a way to get busy and I've been really into these, to, these like, this idea on not knowing what you're going to do, but just engaging yourself in some sort of practice and getting out there wherever there is and doing it and my idea just kind of came from a dick and fart joke which was like I just was thinking about highways and the romance of go west young man grow up with the country and I was like well what's kind of like what's the opposite of that what's a really unromantic highway I was like oh the NAFTA superhighway I-69 I was like Oh yeah, hmm. That connects. That connects uh, the Kinsey Institute. So that talks about sex. Um, you know, sixty nine is a sexual position. Oh, so it just was really dumb. It was just a dumb, impulsive <laughs> idea. That then I was like, well, I'm getting in the fucking car and I'm driving from Chicago and I'm going to go to the tip top of Indiana and I'm going to take it all the way down and exploring the history of that highway. Um, of course, I grew up in Muncie and Muncie's like a little bit off of sixty nine. Um, yeah, so I was thinking of ideas like, is there a culture to, to this highway, or what kind of um, what kind of pseudoscience, basically, as research, can I apply to this highway and I try to understand through statistics the places and people around this highway? So anyway, how does that look in my work? I, aesthetically, um, it's just a continuation of, of form, formal elements I developed in the last body of work that I um, that I published, and. So I don't think there's like a radical jumping off there, but I think the way that I'm containing myself to subject matters is quite different. Um, so anyway, you know, I guess I could just get back. It's like just tra traveling this highway, and I was like, okay, I'll take this really indexical approach. And um, what do you see on the highway that kind of you know signals towards love or sex? Um, because that's kind of that was the ambition. It's like I want to make this big kind of narrative on love or sex, and maybe it's not going to be explicit, but but it certainly is gonna be the meditation that I work with. And it's like, well, you see, you see 
adult video stores. Um, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit up every adult video store off of I-69 and strip clubs, and I'll go to all of those as well. And um, then I'll then I'll get on the you know on the on the web and find the listings for glory holes, um, and I'll go to all the rest stops and um, all the truck stops. And I did that. So for for the past six weeks, I've been driving up and down I-69. And then I sleep in my car at night in a Walmart parking lot, and I get, you know, maybe possibly in tears because I'm so fucking exhausted, don't know what the hell I'm doing, and I get up and I shoot for another day and then drive back to Chicago. So that's translated in like a shit ton of work so far, a big body of work that's like needs to be edited. Um, so has that ended up looking like portraiture mostly? Yeah, a lot of portraiture, but also um, you, not. Also like landscape. Um, you know, I'd already heard something um, from, from a faculty member at SASC who said, you just can't take a, a landscape anymore. It's too problematic. And I mean, I don't know, I mean, I'm 35 and I shouldn't be so like reactive and, and kind of like rebellious, but that, I, like, I really had a hard time internalizing that. Um, I was like, why can't you be romantic? That seems like such an arrogant postmodern kind of like st stance to take that, um, because it implies too much, or there's some sort of sensitivity that you should have beyond like nostalgia or romanticism or um, sentimentality that you can't take landscapes. So I've been forcibly taking landscapes, like full force taking fucking landscapes. And then abstraction, just like a lot of abstraction. So it is still operating in a subjective documentary, you know, modality, but it is, for me, it's been this, this kind of concentration on if you identify a spectacle or you identify a subject, what what are the contextual clues around that subject that also kind of inform or have to work in dialogue with the subject? Because when I was making my last body of work, there was like this sense of, um, like it was never fun making the work. Traveling for two years, living out of my vehicle, um, existential dreads, you know, like soul debasement, um, not having any reference for what this is that I'm doing, that was very difficult, but there is there was sort of like um, an act an, an activity of energy that would have come out of like going to a place, going to a movement, kind of touching actuality, taking a photo, and feeling in some like in some esoteric way that you've succeeded, that you have captured something, um, and then that, that like leaves very quickly. But what it does is it just informs you maybe how you want to take your next photo or where you want to travel to. So the, the, the one leads into the other. Um, and so now, I don't know, I, I feel like identifying the spectacle, looking to like the margins of the spectacle, or just turning your back on the, the, the spectacle altogether. And so like I've also been kind of like loosely developing a concept for teaching a class, which would be I want, really want to teach a class on uh, how to make boring work. Um, oh, that's funny. I was going to ask about boredom, yeah. oh, ultimately. But um, really, I want to know how you make your the subjects of your photographs feel at ease. It's a collaborative process. I mean, there is no um, formula, and there is no there are no two instances that are exactly the same. I mean, it's sure. The, the Could you tell us about one incident in particular? <coughs> well, I can give you like. Multiple examples, and I think and I think it's fair, right? So uh, maybe I'll start with something that I kind of don't like, but I've done, um, which is this sense of reportage. Um, I never like had some aspiration to be a reporter, photo photojournalist, but I did go to Trump's inauguration, and I also went to Trump rallies leading up to his uh, inauguration. And when you get in those, in those sort of environments. There's something that is is really repulsive about myself in those environments and other photographers. It just it fucking grosses me out because it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You basically you are using that the camera as a gun. You're pointing at people and, and you're murdering them, and that's what you're doing. And it's so fucking easy. And you know it's and it then it serves as this like visual statistic on something that happened accompanying you know text. Um, and I you know and. There's something that is kind of taken for granted that's like an absolute, um, which is just not true. So, you know, in those instances I have, it's like run and gone, it's like seeing something and reacting very quickly to it. But that, you know, I can't say that is, that's not like making a portrait with someone. So, you know, the other instance is 
what I think feels better to me and feels more justifiable and something that I'd rather pursue than being a reporter or photojournalist is is putting the camera like almost last in the process. That it, it, the camera doesn't matter at all. What matters for me and what the way I've made images is my ability to deal with boredom, be with myself, sit with myself, think a lot, not have a radio on, being being total quiet, and observe from a vehicle or arrive somewhere and and observe and then and then interact with people and talk with people and on a purely human level. And, and if something comes out of that, then that's, that's where that activity of collaboration begins. And I do think it's collaborative. Um, I don't think I'm taking photos and I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think there's this, this power dynamic wherein I'm, I've got a lot lording over anyone else when there is a sort of verbal contract, an emotional contract that the two are going to the photographer and the subject. Um, and I enjoy it far more. So like for me it is a process of connecting with someone. And that is what distinguishes it from another instance where it's like hitting the spectacle, hitting it on the mark. And like it's, uh, it's something I always call it, and I got into a beef with a photographer like a couple of years ago. And I was like, all these fucking photographers, it's like, it's like they're playing Big Bug Hunter at the bar and they're just like trying to get a high score and like, you know, get the bullseye and it's kind of repulsive. So like when I've kind of been guilty of that, like that's where I'm like, I need, to, I need to put that down. Like that's, that doesn't feel righteous to me, it doesn't feel good to me and it doesn't feel in any way accurate, you know? So yeah. I feel like that sort of relates to the next thing I want to ask you, which, you know, um, I've asked you in other ways in the past, but as you've kind of made a hard turn, like from media to media, sort of landing on photography, what can you get at through photography that you don't feel like you can get at through, you know, through printmaking, through draftsmanship, through music? Hmm. Well, I mean, geez. French philosopher Deleuze would say that you would pick something, you know, that each like form has its own sort of like specificity, or that you, like 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 you think about cinema within the sort of demands of cinema and photography, seemingly the same way, or writing or philosophy, even that sort of like there's this kind of like cosmos or this sort of. Um, yeah, this environment in which you enter to kind of make that work, and that would be like kind of dictated by the medium in, in, in a certain way. I used to, you know, when the questions like that would come up, um, like, well, why did you stop making this kind of work, and why did you start making this other kind of work? And that's a different question than saying, like, well, what is it about photography that's like very specific? Because one is sort of like a reaction to the past and then propelling you into something else, like as if like the impetus was defined by the thing that you just did. But like, you know, for photography, for me, I mean, in some ways it's, it is pretty lowbrow. It's just like, well, it's because it's cinematic and you can, and you can do things that you can't draw, you know, and it's that easy. Um, but in other ways, it, for me, there, like having to have some sort of precedent and understanding like where I was coming from, it just felt more actual. Like it felt like I had to be held accountable more. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming all ethics here that like if I make an image, I have to be held accountable for the sort of ramifications of making that image. Like I am certainly not like in this place of like self-policing thought crime of like my id comes up with an idea and I want to pursue that. Well, I'm going to pursue that. But then I'm also going to like take that image. I have to be in the physical space that other person or that, you know, the place that I'm in has a sort of like set of, you know, as, as, as code or ethics or boundaries or, or whatnot. And I have to like mitigate that, I have to interact with that. And, I, and there's something about that that's more, for me, was like, oh, this is when photographers talk about like touching the hand of God or like a poet would, we you know, would talk about their work in that way. It's like, this maybe is the closest you can, the closest as you can get to like, maybe seeing someone's soul, maybe like experiencing someone's reality. And that's like not a popular thing to say, but it's certainly much different than exploring the interior space of oneself in a studio 
um, making paintings. It is, it just inherently is. So I just feel like photography defines, kind of defines um, its own language and its own set of questions. And there's just something about those, you know, to that medium that is just more interesting to me. And I'm still figuring that out. What's your house like right now, William? <laughs> um, well, uh, my house, my house. Uh, well, I was living, um, I'm kind of like, I don't really have my own house, so I'm, I've been like stepping in and taking little spots temporarily in Chicago. So I've only been there six weeks. So I was living in Humboldt Park, which is on the west side um, of, of the loop of Chicago. Uh, but now I'm living in south, on the south side, like kind of near um, Oak Park, where, or not Oak Park, Hyde Park, where the Obamas have a house. But the um, University of Chicago is there, but I, but I live in a where I am, the only white person in a six mile radius. You got your dog there? He's not with me right now. Someone else has got him. So, yeah, like, um, I don't have a home there. Like, and I don't know. I was even like sleeping in the studio a lot. So, I don't have a home yet. I'm, can I, like, reticent to commit to a home in Chicago um, for the amount of time that I'm gone or I'm just in class? Mm -hmm. So. It just kind of seems like a waste right now right. to spend a lot of money on a home. So you've been a knickknacker in the past, but now no, it's it's an, it's an austere new no, phase. Yeah, like I'm a giver away. Yeah. yeah, like it, that doesn't interest me at all, all yeah. anymore. And like, you know, and, and, and people will say, well, you know, kind of collecting things is like a representation of your like an emotional interior. And I think it is like for a lot of people. Um, and it just wasn't healthy for me. So like I gave a lot of things away. And yeah, I've really pared it down in a, in a pretty militaristic way. <laughs> so, yeah, it feels clean. You go to the boxing gym? Um, no, I'm not yet. Um, after, like, trying jiu-jitsu, I think that might be, like, the angle to go. I like it. So, like, it's so cerebral and physical, and boxing is kind of like, ah, I mean, a little too crunchy. But that's, <laughs> that, like, got me thinking about these boxing clubs associated with parks in Chicago. Um, every kind of major park in Chicago has its own youth boxing club. And it's sort of like, if you can imagine, like maybe kind of like a Karate Kid kind of energy, where there's like a distinctive vibe to each. I think I saw that movie. Each click, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they have their own like kind of seal or uh, you know crest and colors they fly and like. Um, so I've been really interested in that, like exploring like young kids fighting. Um, that's that's pretty fascinating. Too. So yeah, that box. Small little. Hard fists. Yes. Uh, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, they're toughies, though. Imagine the little colorful bruises yeah. that cover your body. Yeah. 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 The decor. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, thank you for being willing to talk to me. Yeah, I've, I've I've been a fan, you know, from afar, and I'm really proud of this work that you're doing, and I think this is a really good medium for you, and um, I look forward to seeing, you know how these outside institutions that maybe once snubbed you start to validate you <laughs> and you have a power Oops. position that you can say no. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you, William. Cool, let's take a 10 to 15 minute break and then we'll come back with some more interviews. Welcome back to Putty. Uh, I hope everybody had enough time to get a drink, uh, take a piss, smoke a cigarette. If you smoke, I don't smoke. Uh, but yeah, welcome back to the season finale of Putty. This is round two. I'm your host, Aaron K. Drew. Uh, <laughs> I'm very excited because we have a very special artist in from Germany. Uh, I wasn't going to announce him because I wasn't sure if he was able to attend. However, he's here on a very special symposium. So uh, let's give a very warm welcome to Rudy Vogel. Rudy Vogel, please uh, accompany me on the stage here. Oh, Mr. Vogel, are you okay? Yeah, Mr. Vogel. Uh, well, please take a seat. Here, here's the microphone. I'm so sorry for my 
Uh, Mr. Vogel, it's so good to have you here. It's very embarrassing. Yeah, me. so, um, it's okay, everything's yeah. fine. Uh, how was your trip from Germany? How was my trip onto the stage? Stop. Oh, yeah, wow. Well. Stop! What are you doing? Wait, no, 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 stop. Oh, oh. Aaron. I, I don't understand what you're doing right now. I didn't think I'd see you here. <laughs> okay. My eyes see it's five. <laughs> it's two. Season one, Aaron. Two. That's me. What are you doing? <laughs> you know oh well, you know, I just, I just thought it, that we we'd have a, a special guest from Germany. You know that I thoughtfully curated all the guests that are here this evening based on people that I think are incredibly brave and are making work that's super ethical and contributes to the discourse <laughs> in contemporary art. Yes, I understand that. So I think that you'd be really excited because Mr. Vogel's work is incredible. Thank you. Uh, no! You're welcome, Mr. Vogel. No, you and I both know that it's pap. It's garbage. I can't believe that anyone would be making drawing huh? in 2018. I just, I look at Mr. Vogel's work and I, I feel a touchstone to my ancestors. It's, it's this childlike naivety. It's incredible. Like... This is not what I'm going for, but I like it very much. No, this is exactly the problem with what's with art right now. That's it's a uh, blowhard, genius posturing with you know pseudo academic. Now, Mr. Vogel's got he's got the uh, he's got the know-how to back it up. Like if you look at it, have you ever seen the work? I it's it's terrible. No, it's I I don't have. You, there's a touchstone for every drawing, every genre of of art is exists in his work. This it's from everything I knew about it, it's cloying, it's middle brow at best. It looks like it belongs to the shoebox section of a Hallmark store. Now this isn't a I do not get a reference. <laughs> this isn't a reverent art for a reverend's sake. Mr. Vogel, you have a bit of uh, schmutz on your chin there. This is intentional. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Have you seen the art? Everything's so... In yes, I've seen the art. Here, Mr. Vogel, what's your website? Let's pull a work up. Uh, Here, my phone is right there. Well, okay. What's this body work? It's... Man manual ornithology. Okay, yes. manual ornithology. Manual, the, the body of work... Made, that's my personal favorite. That's why I invited him okay. tonight. Okay. Uh, manual ornithology, it's wonderful. This is Everybody, the work that you're showing you in the your symposium? Phones. It's uh, uh, very uh, Aryan in nature. Uh, avian, avian, avian in nature. Wait, wait, this I is the word? Yeah. The Dude, yeah. this is a ham turkey. I know, isn't it incredible? This is so, a ham turkey. It's so childlike and innocent. But what are you doing? Get off my stage! What are you now, Mr. Vogel, okay. let's let's let him speak about the work. Mr. Vogel, let's talk about manual ornithology. Uh, first of all, Aaron, Aaron, you look ravishing this evening, and I thank you very much for having me here. Let me put my yoga down. Uh, so, the hand turkey is a very ancient picture for human civilization going way back, way, way, way back to Sumeria. And the five points, if you look into the caves in Neolithic man, the hand is printed all over whether it be in dye or blood wow. or crushed berry. That's so incredible. And Mr. Now, will continue. And given the season of thanks, I think it's very prescient, if not prescient, you know? Has that got better life since the Avian Aaron thing? You're weird. Anyway, I think the 500 turkey really shows the primal, prime great? number. You love this. Well, you could talk sorry, about continue. me. You too, you have this energy abounding me that is just ravishing so me, exhausting me. No, we're me. totally here for it. The turkey, the turkey. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Truth is a lie. Okay? <laughs> the only truth is okay. death. You're lying is bullshit? Wow. Are you not listening? What is this symposium you're at? It's, uh, uh, don't worry about it, you know? 
Well, he's a bird watcher. It's German fest right now. <laughs> the Audubon Society? Uh, it's the Autobahn Society. Yeah, I cannot drive 55. It's Autobahn. What it, so you're, you're showing this garbage work. Season one, Aaron. Look, I know we've been getting closer over the course of this season, and you don't embarrass me as much as you used to, but you're doing shit like this, you're bringing on these guests that are just everything I hate about art. Just, you can't be here, I need you to leave. Wow, okay. Um, all right, Mr. Vogel, I think that Herr Vogel. you should... <laughs> Here, Vogel, I think that yeah, you should finish your yogurt in the audience. Here. We need we need to leave I the stage. Did you want Aaron to leave and take this guy with you? Okay. And all his yogurt. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry, Mr. Vogel. I hope you have a nice time looking at the cars. I'm going the to birds. leave my yogurt I'm not sure. here as a generous gift. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk later. Aaron. Uh... I apologize. You should. Yeah, I understand that um, it's not about me anymore. We should leave some things in the past. Yeah, I mean, I thought we were seeing eye to eye, but I see how much I've moved beyond you. Well, if it's any consolation, I'll still be with you. But it's time for me to go. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'll miss you. I think I'll miss you too. <laughs> Everybody say goodbye to season one, Aaron. Bye. Bye. Hello? Boop. I'm Sorry about that. That was sort of embarrassing. But, um, look, we're right back where we started, uh, and we're ready for another interview. So, um, if you could please join me in welcoming our real scheduled guests who are actually supposed to be, to be here this evening, uh, join me in welcoming the hosts of the Art and Labor podcast, OK Fox and Lucia Love. Straightforward show, yeah. so oh, we thought we'd like mix it up. <laughs> the last act was natural. <laughs> the less we laugh, the better. But <laughs> thank you for coming on Putty. Oh my God! Thanks for having us. This is so awesome. Yeah. Um. So I kind of want to start start by offering an overview of your podcast, Art and Labor, which I feel like. I kind of got in on the on the ground floor because oh my God, for real, yeah. I feel like I'm, you know, the specific constituency <laughs> that you were pitching to. Right, the but, truest of doodle bitches? 
Are you yeah. the number one true doodle bitch? Uh, I think. Do we have the doodle bitch shirts here tonight? I don't uh, know. I mean, well, we like our first, like our. We should have shirts that just say true doodle bitch. That's but true. I'll work on it. That's like a really good idea, but like for now we have these like fucked up Andy Warhol shirts because we, we hate his We guts. hate Andy Warhol. We hate him. Woo! He's a sociopath. Woo! He's a murderer. His art sucks. He's a sexist. Yeah. He's boring. Sucks. He's ruined art. He and loves and urine. And, a, and it's our original idea was a shirt that just said Valerie Solanus is right. Fuck yeah! <laughs> was right and like and just like a big target on his head and like, oh yeah so here, here he is though you can Lucia get shirts one. like yeah I got yeah. this one is like all blue. Lucia is like double print. print. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> take it off. Uh, you can read that. It says Valerie Salamis was right. Well, it says, it says, gee, Valerie, you were right. Uh, but, like, because we toned it down a little, because we have these stickers that were the original, like, full on, like, Valerie Salamis was right. Um, and then people were like, are you sure? Like, people what if like somebody, them. like, listens to your podcast and then, like, shoots Damien Hurst or something? <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and I was sort of like, cool. Uh, Do you think stickers good. <laughs> Go, Some of them have gone into the bathroom here tonight. I noticed yeah. that. They have, yeah. They're very tightly uh, put up there, by the way. Yeah. We, I can, so I can tell yeah. that you guys have BFAs. And artists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the placement yeah. was very important to us. The juxtaposition between the <laughs> punk bands and our podcast. <laughs> There's no room for unprofessionalism. We just wanted them to have a conversation together and um, expound upon what it means to be in, in DIY, but talking about fine art and oh, what these different worlds, how do they interact? You're in the, you're in the right place, baby. I, I, I feel like I'm picking up what you're putting down. It's about ideology. Um, I cannot be afraid of ideology. So, initially... We're really on one. La, 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 la. Yeah, how, how's Indianapolis treating it? They gave us two hams, and um, let me tell you, I like hams. I think they're better than PBR. I think they're better yeah. than uh, the other cheapo beers. I think it's very good. But they're, they're not sugar. better than Sao Ting Tao. Sing Tao. We like Sing Tao. We love Chinese beer. Thank you. Have you guys had? It's good. What's the last? What's the last uh, Pam's talk show better, that gave you Sing Tao? <laughs> no, we just had some at a restaurant one time, and we were like, "This is the best beer." It's a formative, a formative experience. Yeah, it's right? better than American beer. We kind of have like mice brains. We're like, "This is the best beer." No, this is the yeah. best beer. The one that's in front of you at that experience. Yeah. yeah. Same with movies. The one that you run yeah. into at the end of a maze, or. <laughs> Yeah, anything that we get as a prize for free, we're the like, thing this that's is right up front thing. of you is the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> I I feel that way. Uh, I suppose. Um, yeah. But I do have a short memory, which yeah. reminds me of. Um, okay, so art and labor early on seemed to be kind of a podcast that hinged on radical history. Kind of each episode recounting uh, some aspect of. Um, I don't know. Taking on a, a radical history from a certain era, and then it seems like the podcast has really like expanded from there. And I kind of want to know like what your initial vision for it was, and like how that's deviated, and how you expect it to continue to deviate. Um, I mean, I I can definitely answer that. I don't want to. I feel like I'm talking too much, but um, so like I want to do the podcast. I had to say idea of like the, the art world's so fucking shitty and we should talk about it. I listen to a lot of um, Street Fight which is a really great podcast out of Ohio of these like two anarchist dads and they just like talk about like shitty job experiences and I wonder like, if anyone here has yeah? listened to Street Fight. Street I, Fight? I saw it Street Fight house. live here. Oh cool. Anyone else? No? Okay. They did come to Indiana I, yeah and they're they're great they're really great and um, I love them. Uh, I love Kratom as a result. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they sell, they sell Kratom. They're, they're really, they're neat guys. Um, but yeah, um, and I wanted to do like something like that, but like that specifically talks about our weird fucked up industry. And um, yeah, because I had a really bad experience working for Artform magazine and they like imploded and it was really fucked up. And then I was going to um, this um, Marxist reading group that Lucia was a part of 
and um, talking about it and then talking uh, at the bar after the reading group with Lucia and being like, yeah, I want to do this podcast, I have this idea for it. And, um, and like, Lucia wanted to be involved too, but, like, wasn't sure about... An I had my own journey, and I, I would be yeah. happy to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> Just for kind of figuring out what yeah. the shape of the podcast would be, or... Um, well, it's like, Lucia wasn't sure if, if she wanted to be anonymous, or, like, if she was yeah. ready to, like... Well, um, I, I had this whole other... to the project. Yeah, yeah, I had this whole experience of actually being in these other um, art industry gigs and talking to friends and being <laughs> like, wow, yeah, it would be really cool if we had some kind of, like, a call-out thing, or, like, something <laughs> where we could actually express what was going on in these, like, environments where people decide like not to pay you if they feel like it or they decide they are allowed to abuse you like emotionally or physically or like you know sexually um you know if they feel like it and what you can do uh and is that's just like the if they if they do that you have no recourse because yeah. like it's either like they won't give you a job again or like their friends won't give you a job again or yeah. like how do you combat nepotism um, uh, by telling the truth. Yeah. Um, it's like, it's, so it's like a really, it was like a sort of difficult thing that we were sort of grappling with when we were like, so we planned the podcast for like a solid, like, month or and a half or something, just like talking about like, what would it look like? And like, yeah. if you want to be anonymous, it's fine. And we'll it was, figure it out. It's and scary because like, it's like, yeah. I, I do all the jobs that are like, the, the people who know the people and everything runs on a secret where you find out a, a decision was made like a month ago and then nobody told you but they just tell you what to do and they're like well now now you're just gonna be put on this project and like you know you should comply yeah and so like at first we were like yeah maybe we'll just do um, topics from the past and then it's fun to just talk about history and like and like and examine groups that were trying to organize like in in a, like a, a labor oriented or leftist or like social justice fashion in the past within the art world and we can just talk about them and that's like kind of one yeah. step removed from our own experiences that we can be more objective or something. Yeah.